Welcome to High Tech Heroes, a program which takes you behind the scenes of today's high tech industries, where you can meet the people and examine the ideas creating tomorrow's technology. And now coming to you from the studios of Foothill College and Cable Access Los Altos, high atop the mountains overlooking Silicon Valley, here's your host, Sherwin Gooch. Hello, I'm Sherwin Gooch. Welcome to High Tech Heroes. Our guest this week is a specialist in computer graphics. He grew up in London, where he wrote short stories and built model boats and model airplanes. In secondary school, he was so attracted to computer graphics that he built his own plotter for an ICL 1900 computer. He first studied physics and electrical engineering at Cambridge, and then went on to earn a PhD in computer-aided design and manufacturing. He found animating natural scenes more to his liking than the standard industrial applications of computer graphics, so he concentrated on this area. First at Alias Research, and presently at Apple Computer, where he's a researcher in the Media Technology Group, modeling, animating, and rendering synthetic and natural phenomena. And so I'm happy to welcome a computer graphicist specializing in natural forms and movement, Gavin Miller, to our program. Hello, Gavin, and welcome to High Tech Heroes. Hello, Sharon. It's nice to you to have me here. That's great. Well, so how did you get started in computer graphics? Well, um, my first interest in it was um, when I won a chemistry prize, which was the book of Jacob Bednowski's series, The Ascent of Man. Ah, and it yes. had a number of illustrations in it. And uh, he particularly had tumbling three-dimensional wireframe graphics, which I'd never seen before. And that was what got me into building the plotter. And then when I got to Cambridge, after I got my first degree, I wanted to do a PhD in graphics and um, found a CAD company that sponsored that work. Um, and at that time, I was interested in modeling things like chalices and geometric forms. And then late one night, um, a hairy spider crawled up the room. So um, this is your grad student sitting in some... Right. It was actually in the basement of this uh, Gothic building with arched windows and everything. Mm -hmm. And this big hairy spider walked up the wall, and uh, then it fell down back behind the terminal where I was sitting. And of course, in my imagination, it was three in the morning, it got bigger and bigger. And so the next day, I decided that I had to build one. So, um, so this is really how you got into modeling natural phenomena. That's right. As to I thought that um, it would be exciting to try to use CAD tools for doing natural forms as well as mechanical ones. And so I went out and bought a plywood Japanese uh, souvenir toy, which you slot together. We digitized the points on the toy. And so this uh, is a toy, was a toy spider. Right, it was mm -hmm. a tarantula. And um, put it through the CAD system and ended up with a wireframe drawing of a spider, which is... So uh, do you have some... Uh, Slides to show us? Yes, yeah, uh, the first slide is the wireframe spider. Okay, so let's so see the first slide. Okay. okay, so this is spider you're talking about, and this is from okay. a wireframe model? That's right. And then the next slide. So, um, you can see that it, here it looks as though it's been uh, cast in aluminium or something like that. And in fact, I did build a real spider using a numerically controlled milling machine of this particular data set. Because of the CAD CAM connection, you were able to right. take uh, yeah take your model and just turn um, it into uh, uh, a to solid sculpture. aluminum huh? right. or aluminium. Right. Okay. But uh, then I thought it would be much more interesting to try to do graphics which look more like a living spider. Uh -huh. So the next slide, if we can see that, uh, shows the first attempt at this. Uh -huh. You could brighten the slide. It's a bit dark. Yeah, it's a little bit dark. So there. I took the geometric model and drew a number of black line segments off it to try to model uh, the hairs on the spider. But th now this is a picture of this is a picture taken okay. off the computer screen of a uh, synthetic image of, of the spider. And where the data originated, though, not from a real spider, but from a model? From the model, okay. Right, okay. the toy. Um, but this didn't look very convincing, so uh, I went away and read about the way that materials reflect light and devised a special shading model for, for fur. And now, if, now, are these... Uh, which is shown in this slide, which looks more like a, a cuddly toy. You're talking about reflection. Are these uh, ray trace? Uh, no, it's actually a scanline algorithm. Okay. Where well, the computer starts at the top of the screen and works out which polygons are where on each scan line and then shades them for a given pixel. Okay. okay. So it's hard to do shadows and reflections, but uh, you can get realistic looking isolated objects. So um, the next slide, if we can see that, is uh, the original version of a poster which I did for a, a big party at my college called a Mayball. And then the final slide, or the, the final version of this picture, which is the next slide. Um, shows the fur applied to that model and uh, the use of the sort of texturing to make more realistic looking pictures seem very interesting 
and I wanted to apply it to a wider range of things. So if we can see the next slide. This shows um, one of the pieces I did where fractal models are being used to generate the mountains and the clouds in the sky. Um, the dragon is modeled in the same way that the spider was, and there's in fact an illustration of one of the stories which you talked about. And then the fire coming out of the dragon's mouth is what's called a particle system, where little particles spray off and move. Now, what exactly are fractal models? Fractals are models where um, there's detail at every range of scale. So it has large pieces, which are the mountains, but then on the mountains there are little bumps, and on the little bumps there are even smaller bumps, mm -hmm. down to the, the resolution of the so screen. So it's just a mathematical algorithm? Uh, for generating texture okay. of a particular type. So um, this was uh, interesting, but so far in Cambridge, I hadn't been able to get access to any video equipment, so I'd only done still pictures. Uh -huh. And so um, after I finished my PhD, I went to live in Canada for two years at Alias Research and uh, started work on doing animation and modeling realistic pictures at the same time and trying to combine the two. Okay, so natural, natural scenes or synthetic right. natural synthetic rend so nat renditions of natural scenes. Natural phenomena, okay. which is uh, anything that's seen in nature and not designed particularly by man. Mm -hmm. So a car isn't a natural phenomenon, whereas a sunset is. Oh, okay. Okay. So the next slide um, shows a worm. Um, Ooh. I was interested in going back to uh, study the motion of things, and something like a dragon or a snake seemed too complicated to start with, so I did a worm because the motion's well understood and you can use real physics to simulate the motion of each little segment. So this is actually like a, a slide out of a film? or This is a slide out of an animation, which I'll show in a little bit. Uh, now, what about the wood on the desk? Is that also uh... The wood is a synthetic texture as well. Oh, so, okay. I thought um, maybe that was real. No. When it, it, the way it's done is to model the cross-section through a tree with the tree rings and the xylem. Oh, that detailed. Right. Amazing. And then there are controls using, again, using fractals to control how swirly the wood grain is. And, uh, the nice thing about a computer is once you have the shape inside it, you can then render the shape in as if it's made of any material. So it can be wood or marble. And, great, uh, great. So, and this was the, uh, the most complex picture that I did at Alias, which showed off now what? having a snake model, uh, a fractal fire, uh, the flames in the fireplace that generated. Oh, so this is fractals. all fake? This is, this is all synthetic. Oh, yes. OK. It looks like a real the fireplace photograph. was modeled by a friend of mine, Steve Williams, and a group of us worked on the picture. And um, I did. Uh, procedural model for the tree where the computer makes up the positions of the branches mm -hmm. based on some algorithm. And again, this is not ray traced? No, it's not ray traced. It's done using a scanline algorithm. And reflection maps are used to do the reflections in the floor, and you'll see an illustration of that on the video. Okay, great. So, um, so, so none of that was ray traced, and it's still, it's still very good. Well, you'll see how that's done on the tape. Okay, so uh, do you want to show the tape now? Is that yes, if we could. Okay, sure. Um, and this tape is... is uh, this tape was done in Canada, and it was done um, to illustrate a number of the techniques which I developed for rendering and animating natural phenomena. And it's called, what, Advanced Rendering and Animation? So it's a series of little studies of different things. So it starts off looking at having a computer uh, determining the motion of an individual particle or projectile, and by changing the atmospheric drag you can get different trajectories. And then once the computer knows how to do a single particle, you can teach it to make up random particles and do several thousand. Mm -hmm. And because the computer is doing the work, it doesn't take any extra effort on the part of the animator. How many times real time does this take to, to generate a frame? It's possible to do those sorts of things in real time now oh. on graphics workstations. So here I was looking at particles which have forces of interaction with each other. Here they're just bouncing off each other inelastically and look like golf balls. Whereas here they have um, different sorts of forces. It's like shampoo or something. Right. So uh, salad dressing. It was supposed to be two tomatoes with salad uh -huh. cream on, but it uh, doesn't look very appetizing. And then by changing the profile of the forces between the particles, you can get um, things like shaving foam. Now what's this? This is uh, cohesion or? Cohesion. They stick yeah. together instead of just mm -hmm. sliding over each other. And then extending this to three dimensions. Um, you can see you can start with a lump or something and then it'll spread out. Now though, the curvature of the spheres is um, quite low, so you see the individual spheres, but it's possible to do a lot more particles now. And then here, using the same mouse that I used for the liquid in the previous two-dimensional example, you can see a fairly disgusting-looking fountain. Yes, sort of a fountain. Right. And 
What are inverse kinematics? Then? Inverse kinematics are where you have um, part of a mechanism constrained to slide or move um, and other parts which are free. And it's a way of the computer working out the dependent parts from the independent parts. So you can turn a crank and see the motion. And this was just a little test we did to check our shadow algorithm. Uh, and I'll come, come back to talking about those effects later. So um, here is more of the uh, effects that we use for doing the wood. And by um, having a different image that you mangle with the fractal, you can get wood or marble effects. So this is the environment map that I was telling you about. The synthetic camera takes six pictures of a room, um, each with a, a wide angle lens. Okay, so it's like being inside a cube and having right. a picture of each wall. Right, and then from that you can determine the reflections in different directions. And so here's the drum with and without reflections and reflections on the floor as well. And this was how the uh, Christmas card was done. Okay, so that's a high-tech Christmas card. Right, and then another use of fractals from the solid texture is to use it to modulate the transparency. And if you move the object through the texture space, you can make it look as though it's billowing smoke. That looks like real smoke. Right. And then this is looking at using surface texture to actually change the shape of something. Instead of just making it look bumpy, it actually changes the appearance and you can see that it affects the shadows. That the looks like it's ice melting almost. Right. We did that by blurring out the picture. And then it's possible to have animated textures as well, which in this case was being used to do water. Mm -hmm. So you can see that you can get quite realistic looking effects. But to get motion which um, is easy to specify, you really want the computer to understand the physics of the way things move. So this is a chain made up out of a series of masses connected together by springs. And you just let go of them, and the computer computes the motion automatically after that. And you can do that both for things which are just independent, like the chain before, or which collide with themselves and other things. That's it's really impressive. Example. I mean, it looks like a real chain bouncing. Right, and uh, once it's, when the program's written, it's very easy to animate and use. So people don't need to understand the physics once it's in, so in the program. So you don't have to compute vessel functions or anything for this, it just... Um... Right, it just comes out of the numerical solution. So the final thing was applying um, this sort of uh, physical simulation to the motion of living things. And this was a first attempt at doing a sort of caterpillar, I call it, but it yeah. looks more like a squirrel tail that's alive. Yeah, it does look alive. like it's being pulled across a, a table or something. Anyway, so you brought... Uh, some more film clips that demonstrate right. finally some more natural uh, phenomena. So uh, and this is the sort of the best of the bunch okay. in the next clip. In the um, next clip, but uh, I guess we'll show those uh, in a minute. But uh, so first, listen to this. Welcome to High Tech Heroes, a program which takes you behind the scenes of today's high tech industries. Hello and welcome back to High Tech Heroes. I'm speaking here with Gavin Miller today about uh, animation of natural phenomena, computer animation that is. And uh, Gavin has brought along uh, a number of, of clips and slides to show us. And what can you tell us about the next clip we're going to see? Well, the next clip shows um, several different pieces, um, one of which you've already seen, which is the fountain piece. Mm -hmm. But it also shows um, a tree growing from a little sapling into a fully fledged fir tree. and in in this case, the computer had a model of a stack of cells growing right. and uh, positioning of the branches. So now when you say a stack of cells, you mean like tree cells? or Tree cells. And the cells would divide and grow, and this would then lead to other branches, That's and the branches would get bigger and a move. pretty detailed way to, to right. make a model of a tree. It is, but it does mean that uh, once you have one tree, you can make a forest of trees at different ages and things. And how many times real time is that? Well, this took um, actually uh, two hours of frame. And okay. it's 30 frames a second, so that's more slow. like it. But it is possible to do much simpler versions uh, much more quickly. But so, should we show that video now? Let's show that video. Okay. And, uh, and this one's the tree just is just one, one excerpt? One natural phenomenon. And, and this is called Natural Phenomena? Yes. Also from Alias? Also research? from Alias Toronto. Toronto, okay. Right. So, here's the tree growing, and as you can see, the little um, branches grow on the bigger ones, mm -hmm. and uh, you can see the needles growing out. And the computer's also um, determining which branches cast shadows onto other branches. So this isn't a fractal tree at all. This is a cellular tree. Well, yes, it's a, it's a continuous growth L system, as it's called. And then this is the fountain again. Uh -huh. But this time with a sort of Monty Python-esque room for the particles to bounce <laughs> off. Okay, are the reflections of the room in this? Uh... No, they're just reflections of the light. 
Uh -huh. So this is the animation of the worm. And uh, in this case, the computer is modeling the physics of the muscles. And as the muscles contract and grip the ground, the worm is pushed forwards. This is Eric the Dynamic Worm. Eric the Dynamic Worm. Where did his name come from? Um, well, a little bit inspired by Monty Python's Half a Bee. So. Oh, I see. Now, the interesting thing about Eric is that when he gets to the edge of the book, he starts to dangle down under gravity. And all this motion is completely automatic. It's like the chain was um, earlier, that once the worm is set in motion, it goes off and phlegmatically keeps That's... wriggling forwards until it falls off the book. Is this what you call goal-directed movement? No, this is just um, uh, movement without goal direction. Uh, mm -hmm. If it was goal directed, he'd probably try not to fall off the book. But because he doesn't know about the world and change his behavior, um, he uh, comes to a sticky end. <laughs> so this, uh, talking of sticky ends, this is uh, an animation which I did, which simulates the scattering of light off the atmosphere. So That's once the beautiful. computer has the model of the atmosphere, you can just change the sun position and get all the colors of a sunrise. Now, one interesting thing about this model is that you can also predict what the effects of um, something like a nuclear winter would look like, or uh, if pollution got out of hand and everywhere turned into a, Just change some a more extreme version of LA, you could uh, determine what that would look like. That's and amazing. so this was a sort of apocalyptic So that blue is due animation. to the absorption? The scattering, of preferential nitrogen? scattering of light off ni oxygen uh -huh. and nitrogen. Okay. Right. Yeah. And then here I'm changing the atmospheric composition to sort of have a haze of, say, after a nuclear war it might look like this. And then for added gothic effect, I huh. threw in some black snow. Um, Fallout, huh? Right. Which everybody said should splash in the water, although I did watch snow falling on water once and it didn't splash. But if people think it should, then you should, because you know, it's animation rather than... Well, it's black snow after all. Right. So, anyway, so uh, if you want to know what the end of the world looks like, this is one possibility. Well, that, that is fire and ice, I guess. Right. So, um, so that ends the uh, animation that I did in Toronto. And after that, I moved to Apple Computer in Cupertino, mm -hmm. where I've joined the Media Technology Group, and I'm trying to continue this work uh, one day with the hope that it'll be possible on Apple products, but obviously not at the moment. Uh -huh. So um, the next piece that I'd like to talk about does use goal-directed behavior. Oh, it does. Okay. Uh, well, now how many people does it take to, uh, to do a computer video like this? Or well, that's animation? an interesting question. Um, it really is a team effort. It's very hard for one person to sit down and make an animation completely on their own. Um, partly because it just takes a very long time for the computers to do things, and you, it's a very long project. It takes several I mean, months. You end up dividing up into teams of experts. You have right. worm experts um, and well, snake experts. It usually turns into experts. people who are experts in the way things look, mm -hmm. pe people who are experts in the shape of things, and people who are expert in the way they move. Mm -hmm. So. Um, but uh, in this next project, you'll see it was basically done by myself and Michael Cass, which who you can see in the next slide. Okay, so we can see that. Could we have the next slide? Okay, so, and that's Michael Cass. Huh? That's Michael Cass who worked with me on this project. Michael, um, in, we, it was a team effort on most of the things, but Michael in particular looked at taking the um, motion which I computed mm -hmm. using physics and converting that into a really nice looking snake. So he did the deducing the shape of the snake and making that so that it can be deformed and flexed. And do we have a picture of the snake? Uh, yep, the snake is the next slide. And you'll also see um, a parachute which uh, Michael worked it's on. It's an awfully real looking me. snake. Yes, it was, uh, it was a lot of effort to get it all yeah. right. It's but, scary. Well, and the hope was that if we could combine realistic graphics with goal-directed motion, which mm -hmm. is where the character tries to... The character has a, set, a task that it's trying to do and it pulls its muscles and changes around like a real actor would to try to achieve that task. Sometimes it misses if it's physically impossible for it to jump or leap, but if all's well, it goes over, does the next does task, task, and, and once it's done, it then has the next thing to do off its mm -hmm. list of uh, mm -hmm. commands. So, um, in principle at least, you have a series of simple steps which the animator gives it, and the computer mo works out the motion automatically. Of course, in practice, it's still an early day, so you have to tweak all sorts of numbers. Now, you, you say well. you're working on this stuff at, uh, at Apple Computer. Right. Do you expect to be able to do this on a desktop um, anytime soon, or do you think it's a far future, or, um, or you use certain of the techniques are applied to... Uh, some of the techniques, um, in simpler cases, will be mm -hmm. useful in the next mm -hmm. uh, few years. Um, and um, So, yes, I think it will be possible to use some of them. 
But some, I mean, this took 45 minutes a frame on a very expensive okay, computer. And, it, and it's so 30 frames per, per second. second. So, so it takes uh, a month or two 40 to... 40 times 30, I mean, it's like 1,500 right. times real time or something. Right, so you have to be very patient. But computers are getting faster all the time. And, right. Um, right. Well, I, I would like, in fact, I came to this And if you're prepared to drop the quality, do, then having yeah. um, faster movi moving things... Um, yeah, I wanted to do video synthesis, on. and I thought computers would be able to do that, you know, close to real time in... Uh, in 1982 or 83, but it right. hasn't happened well, as fast as I hope. a few more years, I think. Well, anyway, I guess we should see uh, see this this film. Right. It's called uh, Her Majesty's Secret Serpent. Her Majesty's Secret Serpent. And uh, with apologies to James Bond. I see. Self-explanatory. it shows that um, even goal-directed characters can come to a sticky end if they have the wrong goals. <laughs> well, I guess that happens. So, um, I understand you said that you, you uh, milled out a copy of the uh, spider, right? right? I understand you also did the snake. I did. I built, um, using a series of radio-controlled servos, I built an electromechanical snake. Mm -hmm. I, wish, I wish we could have had it here. It's well, like a great toy. Well, unfortunately, I also built a radio-controlled submarine which sank with the radio control in it, so the snake is currently um, in need of a new brain. Well, I see. So, it, so the, uh, the receiver was the same that you used? It was, I'm afraid, yeah. And the, and the submarine sunk around here, huh? That's a shame. Yeah. So, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, fractals and splines? I guess you used both of those. In okay. Um, the terrain in the snake model was generated using fractals, um, where yeah. um, there was basically the shape of the cliff was defined by hand, and then the bumps and the uh, hills were done by a fractal. So it starts with a coarse set of points. It uh, makes points in between, but also jiggles them. It randomizes their positions, and then does the same thing again and again until you end up with texture at every scale of detail. Now, now fractals and splines are both things that, that I've heard a lot about, but I'm not okay. clear exactly what they are. Is there, is there like a, a one-minute explanation? You OK. Can well, the thing I just described is one way of making a fractal. It's, um, it's a texture which has um, bumps or undulations at mm -hmm. different, different scales. Whereas a spline is just a smooth Now, bumps curve. and undulations, you mean, is that mathematically defined in any more rigorous manner, or is it just...? Well, it's, um, it's 1 over f noise, so that okay. as the frequency doubles, you have 1 over f to the n amount of it. So it's just a, that's one way of thinking about it. Okay. Um, whereas a spline is just a smooth curve going through a number of points. It used to be that a draftsman would use a piece of wire that they constrained to three or four points and then draw along the curve left by the mm -hmm. wire, mm -hmm. whereas you can do that mathematically, and that's what a spline is. So a spline is really like a, a piecewise linear approximation? To well, it. it's a piecewise something. Uh, if it's linear, it's just a straight line, but if it's cubic, then it's uh, continuous curvature. Okay. So you can okay. get a smooth shape. And in fact, the um, so it's snake a, it's was a modeled as a, number, fit, as a polynomial okay. curve. And the snake was modeled as a series of control points through which the, uh, the surface went. And so my job was to move around the control points using the physics. And then part of the things that Michael cast did was to uh, put a smooth snake shape through those control points. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And by defining a shape in this way, you can animate it and make it move consistently. Right. Now, fractals are, are chaos, right? 
Uh, <laughs> this is a big subject. It is. Well, I mean, is there anything we can say in a short time about fractals? Um, chaos can lead to fractal type of noise, but uh, chaos is a more complicated subject. Okay. Um, are you planning on building anything else other than your, uh, your oh. snakes and submarines? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. It would be nice to build a snake which had more intelligent behavior, so it had a real computer in it instead of just a radio control. But then it could get into all sorts of trouble on its own instead of having me. Well, maybe you could have the radio control in the, I mean, have the transmitter with the computer on it. Right. So. Anyway, it's really nice that you uh, took the time to come and be here, Gary. Well, that was fun. It's been uh, enjoyable. I'd like to see the snake next time. So. Okay. Well. But. Thank you for joining us this week for High Tech Heroes. Be sure to tune in again next week when we will bring you more entertaining information about the people and ideas behind the scenes in high tech industry. And now, this is your announcer, Joe Busick, wishing you the best of luck and a pleasant week. Au revoir. <laughs>